I mean, I'll, I'll say that the, the, the level of talent in this workshop was great. I was really impressed. What was your expectation? Do you go in with no expectation? Do you, like? Um, when I've done, <laughs> the resumes don't mean that much to me mm -hmm. because I find, even when I, I'm going to teach in LA in a couple of weeks and I haven't taught there since 2019. I was scheduled to go there in 2020 in April and then stuff happened. Um, so I've found that it's a mixed bag because there's not really good training there. And so if the actors know what they're doing, um, it's great. Uh, what I find is that their people have been people in these towns that focus on film and television production for the most part that have representation, have interesting credits, um, and don't really know what they're doing. And, and so, and then sometimes they do. Like sometimes it's just delicious. So I, I think I was expecting um, a mixed bag and hoping that, that it would be exciting. And I think I got more than I bargained for, and I'm, I'm pleased about that. I think there's voice work to be done <laughs> and I think that my religion is action. To me, that's, that's the way. Um, meaningful action. Like, action without meaning is dry. So it's got to have meaning. And to me, that's what it's about. Character, relationships, given circumstances, connecting to that however I can connect to that. I found some of the underpinnings here not fully developed working in your body, and making a practice. I said before uh, to Adam, I said, whatever you practice, you get good at. Yeah. So this work has to be a practice whether you're working or you're not working. And if you're waiting for jobs to try this, uh, then you're at, the, you're at the mercy of the industry. And, and so I, I was expecting less than I got, and I'm pleasantly and, and gratifyingly uh, pleased by the choice of material, the level of talent. Um, yeah, that was nice. There you go. <laughs> That's good to hear. Yeah. Uh, go ahead. Oh, there you go. Oh, um, maybe this was covered in the days that I wasn't here, but I wanted to talk about that. I wanted to ask about the actions and the kind of classic traps. Well, we've covered that. But the metaphors, like when you were saying the sta like stab or that isn't an action. Because no. sometimes I don't, I'm, it's clear in my head, but then it's not actually playable to the other person. Yeah. Do you know the Laban work? Mm -hmm. yeah. Laban work is an interesting uh, way of describing movement. And we teach it in my studio in the movement thing. So that has things like stab and flick and glide and stuff like that. So those are energetic qualities that I find sometimes helpful. Um, and we talked on day one about that uh, narrow book about an actor's guide to actions or whatever it is, it's red and white. Oh, the thesaurus. Something like that. And how I, I find that a very problematic book because about 40 to 60% of it aren't actions. They're, they're uh, objectives. So um, to rehash what we talked about, um, it has to be doable. So stab is, is not a doable action, unless it's actually a physical action where I take a knife and I put it in your heart or your neck, that's stabbing. But I can't take a line and stab you with it. However, the energy in stabbing is interesting to me, right? So I can insult you and I can insult you in a kind of a stabbing way, right? So when uh, Natalie says to Celeste in the last scene, you're a whore, right? There might be something in the realm of the idea of what's it like? You know, you had that thing in Danny in the Deep Blue Sea where uh, Roberta says, I want to take a knife and stick it in there and I want to drag it down to his mouth, right? 
That's interesting. She's painting a picture there. That's the action, is to paint a picture of violence. She's not stabbing. She's painting a picture. And I would say that uh, when Natalie tells Celeste that she's a whore, she's not stabbing. She's doing something. Maybe she's insulting. Maybe she's calling her out. Um, I don't know what she's doing. Uh, but I, I want it to be a doable thing that human beings can do. Yeah, so. And, and you know it's an action if you can do it. So to seduce, which is a verb, is not an action. Because the moment you say to seduce, the question becomes how. To prove, the, 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 to prove is not an action. To convince is not an action. To make someone feel good or bad is not an action. There are things you want to happen in the other person. And then the question becomes, what am I going to do to achieve that? So if whatever you're doing depends on something happening in the other person, it's an objective. Right. Yeah? Yes. Like I'm explaining something right now. The imp and every action has an implied objective. So my objective is for you to understand what I'm doing. But I can't make you understand. I can explain. And either you understand or you don't understand. Yes, yes, it's so clear. Good. You get your script and you're like, seduce. Yeah, well, that's good. That's what I want, right? In, in, in uh, The Graduate, that's what Johanna's character wants. She wants to, to, seduce, to, get, get it, to seduce him, right? But the question is, what's she doing in every moment? Because I can't just act to seduce. It's not doable. Yeah? There was a great check that you gave. I think it was to Brendan where you, you said, well, what would you do if you took that line, if you took that line away and didn't do that? what would happen. Right, Gerline. Yeah. The first line of the scene. What would he do? And then the second one. Well, what, what's the, is Brendan still here? Yeah. What's the second line? Uh, well, I didn't see you, did I, or something? Uh, I didn't see you, did I? Yeah, those two lines he was humming in today's run. run. And he, a lot of great work in that scene. Mm -hmm. And he's exactly the right guy for that. Yeah. Um, but I didn't know what he was doing yet. Yeah, I, I think it's such an interesting thing. I was having, Brendan and I were talking about it a little bit after. I just think that's such a great little nugget for the actor. You don't know what's going on in the line and, and, and what would happen if I didn't say it is an interesting path to discover what you need to be doing in that moment. Yeah. We do these things in the Meisner training with nursery rhymes in the second year. Um, you know, hickory dickory dock, the mouse ran up the clock, the clock struck one and down he run, hickory dickory dock. How to take that or Georgie Porgy pudding and pie or any of these nonsense four to six to eight line things. And the assignment is turn those into real acting with real circumstances, real relationships, and justify every word. Make it and, and have three different legitimate versions of it. So there's the idea factory. How can I take this thing and come up with, hello? Uh, um, how can I take this nonsense text and turn it into something authentic and real and meaningful? I'm sorry. Um, <laughs> and have three different versions of it. Because that also sets you up for flexibility. Because what are you going to do if the director says, um, you come in with an action. You've done your work. And the director goes, yeah, I don't think we're going in that direction. <laughs> Shit. Right, so it causes you to be imaginative. Yeah. And it's a really useful thing because what we're working on is carving out moments, right? We're not doing a whole play, just four lines, which is kind of a typical side in sure. a way. Yep. And having three different legitimate versions of that that are different with different characters, different ideas, clear actions, clear relationships, clear meanings, and then have another one that's totally different. So one might be a murder trial. Another might be I work in a bakery and um, I'm stupid. And, I mean, like just the ideas that start to come, it's the funnest part of the year <laughs> for the people in the second year because they can literally do anything. Right. And that's fun and it's really good training. I love that. It keeps just, it makes me think of thinking relationally within the work so there's always inherent flexibility but inter interconnection i change this one part of the system everything else starts to roll on its own and part of what i'm doing in my training is trying to make actors director proof 
<laughs> because if you show up with a really solid idea, they have to have a better one. And most of the time, they're too busy with cameras and sets and sound and all the other stuff. There's like, you know, they say that casting is 90% of it. So if they've cast the right person and you come in, they're so grateful, like, oh, God, you know what you're doing. I don't have to worry about it. Where you're at risk is if you're waiting. Where's Ellie? Yeah. yeah. Where you're at risk is if you're waiting for them to have the idea, which is how I thought acting was when I was, at, when I was in acting school. Not... Meisner, but before that at NYU, I just thought, I'm the puppet, and the director tells me what to do, and then I'm working with geniuses, and then I do it. You know, it was collaborative a little bit, but I thought my job was to do what they told me to do. Right. And I never really thought, I'm supposed to have ideas. And I think, actually, that is your job. You've got to have all the ideas, because then they've got to have a better idea. So that's a really important mindset. And I think that's a, it's obviously this confining one and you re, it's, com it's completely restrictive. And I think it's one, that back to the, the whole addition, addition, addition stuff we're talking about, you get into this rut and this mindset where I got to do what's on the page in order to book the thing, in order to do the thing. And you get, in the, you get into the mindset of doing it right repeatedly, 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 and it completely can inhibit that. So it's like you have to, you have to foster that. You have to keep that alive at all times, um, not just on set, but almost like the antidote to what you're having to do day in and day out there so you can always be fresh and alive with ideas. Or even with your teams, like, what if your agent or your manager doesn't really get you? I think that's really tricky. So they, they cause the first impression is how you look. And maybe they get how you look because you got a headshot taken. And so that's how they met you. And now they put you into a box. Oh, sexy person. Oh, rough guy. Oh, lower class. Oh, gangster. And so one of the things that I think you have to be careful of is not getting put into that box that you can't get out of. And so one of the things I really respect about Sam Rockwell is that he has intentionally tried to not repeat himself. And so if he does a comedy, then the next movie is not going to be a comedy. No matter, even though after you do a comedy, that's all they send you. Because mm -hmm. they don't have any imagination. This business has no imagination. And so you have to have the imagination and really hold the line and hold out for the right thing. And so he, and, and he did, his other sort of strategy was one for me, one for them. So he'd do a green mile which is a studio picture, after doing Box of Moonlight, which is an indie picture with John Turturro. Play the lead in an indie film. That'll get him some visibility. Then do an Iron Man 2, where he's like number six or eight on the call sheet. He's not Robert Downey Jr., right? Um, and do that. That gives him some money and some visibility to do the next indie film, like a single shot, which was done up here, I think. That's right. Yeah. 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 <laughs> My client, Christy Burke, I coached her. Yeah, I love Christy. Christy yeah. was in yeah. my class. Yeah. Where the fuck is she? I don't know. She found out on Instagram. I mean, you got to keep in touch with old friends. That's right. Hey, what Terry's talking about isn't champagne. It's not like you're talking about the big movie star has his problems, champagne problems. Yeah, I'll, I'll say no to that movie, too. And yeah, but it applies. Sam was fucking delivering burritos yeah, I mean, in New York. It, it applies on the small jobs, too. It applies as you're moving along. And I think this speaks to something, Terry, that's really key. I, I see so many... You know, everything's changed. It's self-tape. We don't get to go and work in the room. And I think where in casting, they're, they're, they're solving the problem through volume, you know, that was once upon, at least here, they're solving the problem with volume where once upon a time it was solved with um, exploration. You'd what, see 10 actors. What do you mean by volume? So, uh, you know, in the before times. They'll get like 100 self-tapes. Yeah, yeah. So, yeah. So they would have 10 people in the room. And over time, you would earn credibility or your agent would push. You have a rapport or with a casting. casting director they'd would rework. Like you. Yeah. yeah, yeah. And, you'd go and you'd get adjustments. And yeah, like you'd get yeah. adjustments. So there's yeah. a couple things here. So you would, you would go in and you would have, uh, you could be a generous actor who made a bold choice that maybe didn't make sense. But you would get, that's a, gen that's a good actor. What if I should to try this? Or, hey, hey, just play it like this. And you would get kind of the secret code or the help. You just had to and be a relationship. Flexible. And a relationship. So you had the immediate feedback and the learning that happens. Plus, they'd uh, know if you were a good hang or not. Yeah. 
Like if you were a dick, they'd yeah. know that. All of and that. And if you were nice, they'd know that. Now they don't know any of that. Right. And so the model used to be you have to earn your way to have that place, and it's yours to keep and maintain. You have to. You don't get to just have it and forget about it. You got to keep working on it. Once you got it, that's kind of money in the bank. You work on that. Well. I look at it like the system, what does the system want? It wants three great options, let's say, to cast. The system being the mechanisms that yep. let us cast. And they would solve that problem as we've just been discussing. And, but now that they don't have it, they can solve the same problem with volume. Right. And, and the problem is that that's burdensome and taxing on us. This speaks to the aid, teaching your agents issue, I think. Yeah. Is taxing on us in the way that it's presently solved is you do a self tip, do a self tip, do a self tip, because nobody has time to take the time to go. This is why you're. Really, I understand this actor really well. And I understand this role really well. This is why you're a really good fit. And so the function of I think what exists between actor and agent, or pardon me, actor and role, has been all kind of muddied up and it's been pushed out to us. And I think the antidote for that is exactly what you're just saying, exactly what you're saying about Sam, is I have to understand where I fit into those stories, how I want to fit in those stories, and I have to prove it to myself, and I have to prove it to the people who represent me, I have to teach them how to represent me to go after the opportunities I want. It cannot be a passive experience, it has to be a proactive experience on our part. Are there agents and managers who are more understanding here? I'm imagining there are. Yeah. Right? Like that really, if, if that's the bridge or that's the gatekeeper between you and the industry until you start to make your own work, which you can, Stallone made his own work, you know. Um, Sam's agent happens to be this uh, Rhonda Price. She's a partner at Gersh. And she's looking for a lifetime relationship with a client. And one of uh, my students at NYU, a guy named Darius Humayun, he's a Persian actor, um, uh, she signed him out of NYU. She went to see a show there, a main stage show, Christopher Durang's show, who just died. It's really sad. He was 75. He wasn't that old. Um, Baby with the Bathwater, really wonderful playwright. Anyway, uh, actually, it was a Nikki Silver show. Um, and she signed him. So he graduates from NYU and then sends him out on stuff he wasn't booking. So she said, Darius, if you're up for it, I think you should go do some more studying with Terry. Do his two-year program. I'll wait for you. Now, that's a rare agent. And he did, and he's been booking nonstop ever since. It was the best thing he ever did for him. And, and she was the kind of agent who was playing the long game. And a lot of agents will tell people who want to study with me, what are you talking about? It's pilot seat. Like they're just seeing the, the thing that's right in front of them and the 10%. Right. And if they're not, if it's not a partnership, then I don't think it's the right relationship. And we often think like, well, I need an agent and this is the only one who is interested, so I'm going to work with them. But if they don't get you, if they're not willing to think of you as an artistic partner, if they're not willing to strategize about where, who do you want to be? What do you want to be in the... Here's how I'm seeing you. If, okay, you want to do Marvel movies? Okay. Well, you definitely need a different headshot because this looks kind of <laughs> friendly and you look like you're ready for Seinfeld, you know? So it could be as simple as that, but like, do you understand each other and will they take your calls? Or is it just, no, no, don't call me. I'll call you when there's something, you know? And then what happened with that self-tape? And if you have like three strikes, you're out. And they drop you because you're not booking instead of, wait, why did you sign me in the first place? If, if we're not gonna work together in the way that, I mean, why are you an agent? If you're an agent just to make the 10%, even that to me is suspicious. Because if you don't love this art form, why are you doing it? So I think that, that becomes pretty important. Yeah. And then you want to work with those people. And, and it's all about relationships. It's absolutely about relationships. And I think that's a, that can be a really scare, uh, scary proposition for an actor to kind of stand up for that, for themselves. I don't mean to be, to, that it has to be argumentative or draw lines, but even just always feel like they can have permission, self-permission to...
put that forward in the first place. I think it can be a really scary place. Um, I think it's also about being connected to each other as actors and helping each other. Um, I think there's a, a, a scarcity mindset that, that's, yeah. that is tricky and like pay it forward. If you hear about something and you're going to be doing something else, recommend a friend. Help that, help that casting director get the thing done with someone you believe in, because I do think from a karmic kind of point of view, it's gonna help you. I agree with that. You know, that job I was talking about with the costume designer, Michael Crass, up in Vermont doing the Michael Frayn play, that happened because my classmate, Rob Nepper, who's been working ever since, had that part. It was being directed by Neil Simon's daughter, Nancy, um, from The First Wife, the one who's dead, Barbara. Um, Nancy Simon, who had just married Woody Harrelson by mistake um, and had to get a divorce. Carrie tells the best stories. I got a Frank, <laughs> by mistake. I got this Frank Sinatra story I want to tell you about that's pretty cool. But um, So Rob had that part, and I was just graduating from Bill Esper's class, and then he got another part doing something else, and he recommended me to Nancy. Now, that didn't mean Nancy had to take me, but he said, you gotta see my friend Terry, he's really good. And so I went to her apartment on the Upper West Side and read the play, read some scenes. I had just gotten the play. And she said, okay, let's do it. And like two weeks later, I was in Vermont doing it, thanks to Rob. And that shit should happen all the time, I think. I think um, so that this community can start to take some of the power back exactly. from the casting geeks because the problem with self tapes besides not getting the feedback not making the relationships is that in what condition are they watching they're eating a fucking meatball sandwich they're watching tapes they're probably high or drunk or whatever and <laughs> Of course they want to find the right person because they want to have those three options because that makes them the right casting director Correct. who's going to get booked again. They're not they're self currency. they're yeah. self-interested. Yes, it's their currency. Mm -hmm. But if they don't if you don't grab them in the first 15 seconds, you're out. Yep. Done. 15 seconds. You know, and so that's pressure, that's weird pressure, you know. I'm I'm really interested in the uh, the scarcity, breaking the scarcity mentality, and the and the sharing and looking out for one another, and it, and it's not just, I mean, the scarcity mentality is everywhere, and everything's in this creative flux. Everybody's freaked out about everything, and it's 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 permeant. Donald I mean, Trump, do, that is you find, scary shit, man. Don't you find, and not to not to make light of anything that's going on, but there is some truth that kind of everything old is new again. I remember uh, when 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 my uh, when my dad was on his final days and we were having, had the little opportunity to have some like final words of wisdom. One of the things it was it was right around the time that Trump that the election was coming up. I remember asking him like, so is most of the stuff bullshit, Pop? <laughs> like, is most of the stuff that comes up? And he's like, yeah, most of the loud talking stuff is bullshit. Stick with it. You know, it's the parting device. It stuck with me. Um, <laughs> Donald Trump. I was scared of Donald Trump. Eh, it'll do this, kid. I think it's important to gravitate, gravitate toward people who operate out of exactly what you're saying. Whether, they're, whether it's a teacher, whether it's somebody you choose to have as your scene partner, whether it's an agent, whether it's a partner, whether it's anybody, it's important to have those people who are generous of spirit, positive problem solvers, and willing, and <laughs> willing to be uh, uh, in it for the work and play you know, for one another. And, and it doesn't mean you have to start fights and go and like raise hell and do all of that. You can just choose not to do that and do what, do what works and find other people. The remembrance for me, I haven't been in a room full of actors like this, God, in five years. Last time I was in this was in the black box in my old studio, which no longer exists because COVID, where I put the first play up and all of that. This is this remembrance of this thing that happened. Mm -hmm. And it's, uh, it's, it's, I feel there's a real resurgence happening. And, and I love, I mentioned to you in passing, when we chose this date, we were originally going to be here in February. Yeah. You mentioned today, and I had mentioned in passing, and I don't know if it landed on you when I mentioned it, but I'm like, it's going to be cherry blossom season then. Oh. Yeah. And, and it's, like, it's it perfect. It so is. And that yeah. is my favorite time in Vancouver. It couldn't yeah. be at a better time. So thanks for being here, man. Yeah. Appreciate you. Questions? No, I don't. Yeah. This is for you. 
Uh, oh, oh, go ahead. Um, what are your thoughts on the future of acting? Given... Jesus Christ Almighty. <laughs> <laughs> what are your thoughts, Adam? <laughs> well, I mean, given the evolution of streaming services and, a and AI. Well, I don't care about AI all that much. I mean, I, I use it. I have ChatGPT. I pay for it. Yeah. And I use it sometimes for ideas or like, where should I go in Mexico or shit like that. Um, um, <laughs> yeah, Puerto Vallarta. Yeah. For six more weeks. But um, I really don't, I think we're going to need stories forever. And even if the plots are generated by AI, if they're not, I, I saw, I saw this uh, little video yesterday about AI, like someone said, write me an email that I can send to John, um, giving him some feedback and inviting him to a, to a meeting. And it came out with this thing and had all this weird stuff in it. And then the three word prompt that improves it is you say, that's too cringe. Hmm. And you put that back in chat GPT and then it like softens it, right? So um, I'm sure there are lots and lots of stories like do a mashup of On the Waterfront and the Muppet movie and like it'll do it, right? How interesting that'll be, I'm not really sure. Um, but I don't think that has anything to do with the future of acting. I think ultimately we need really good stories made in the richest possible way, and that I, I don't think actors are going to be replaced by AI, maybe in a big crowd scene for Game of Thrones or something like that. But I, I, I think, think we're going to need the human beings. So the future of acting to me is bright. And I think the streaming services offer a lot of noise, but also occasionally some opportunities uh, with really great artists. I mean, Scorsese's doing movies on Netflix. That's interesting to me. Um, and so if you can get hooked up with the right collaborators and keep working on your instrument, I think the future is really bright. That's my optimistic feeling. I could be wrong. <laughs> I, I tend to agree with you. I think it impacts the future of the, the future of the delivery of the mechanisms through which we produce and to distribute story. And I think, I think we've, been f we've been lending our craft and presence to a system that's largely been unchanged for a long amount of time and there's all kinds of things that are used to do it. I think what starts to happen is it makes the production of said entertainment the barrier to entry to being a creator is is lowered. And I think what happens is inherently it pushes out opportunity, maybe even responsibility to that to be part of actors. I think you want to be part of a, a part of the the you want to be part of a creative put the stories out community and it'll be more and more opportunity to be in your own hands. I don't think you need to you will need to go to Netflix to be in a series, I think that the billions of dollars that, have spent, that are being spent to produce turns into hundreds of millions, turns into millions, turns into more and more accessible. I really like what Jess said before and the excitement they felt about doing a play in Calgary, mm -hmm. taking that money from the shit abuse and turning it at, like, uh, success is the best revenge. One thing I do notice with all the streaming is that right now the bean counters are starting to get into the creative realm, and I find that disturbing. So, like, I was, I'm coaching someone on an Apple TV show uh, where they're the number one on the call sheet, and someone from Apple TV in a suit was telling them, no, we don't like that costume. Now, what the fuck do they know about that? And budget, because what Apple's really good at, and that's why they're being sued for an antitrust suit for the iPhone right now, and I think they're going to go down, um, but they'll fight it, is making money. They're really good at making profits. 
And so I, the worst experiences with actors that I coach has been on Apple TV. It's just been the worst. And, and they've all complained about pretty much the same thing, which is like, they're going, why do you need more than one take? Why do you need more than two takes? What is that? Come on, chop, chop, time is money. Because that's all they're thinking about is the bottom line. And then Scorsese does Killers of the Flower Moon and they kind of go, okay, Marty, you do what you want to do, and then there's actually rehearsal, but not everyone's Scorsese, so that's the, that's the exception rather than the rule. So I think that, Adam, makes me a little bit nervous. I mean, the fact that there's no rehearsal, like Kazan had rehearsals, and now there's no rehearsal because it's all about money. It's not that the director or the actors are going, I don't want to rehearse, I'm too busy. Squeeze. It's just there's no budget for it, because if you have a rehearsal, you have to pay people. And so that's why I get more work as a coach, because there is no rehearsal. And so how are you going to show up? You have to show up loaded. So that, to me, is the, is the, the main conundrum right now, is how can I really push to be an artist in an industry that seems to be much more about dollars and cents, which it is. Like, that's where the millions and the billions and the whatever come mm -hmm, from. Mm -hmm. And that's why I keep saying that the best thing you can do is to be the best actor you can be. And if you keep creating good work, it's a little bit like Field of Dreams. If you build it, they will come. If you keep putting out good work, if you keep putting out the very best thing that you can put out, you're going to win, right? But it's a little bit harder because of the atmosphere on sets right now. And so you may want to do what Kelly Reichardt does. Kelly Reichardt is one of my favorite directors. She's done five projects with Michelle Williams at this point. She doesn't give a fuck about the business. She has no interest in the business. She's a bit stubborn about that. And um, she just wants to make her work. And, and so she has some compromises in that, but not too many. And because actors respect her so much, they'll work for scale. Michelle Williams is going to work for scale for Kelly Reichardt. She's going to have her agents negotiate millions and millions of dollars for Spielberg and the Fablemans. But then she can do an indie film like Showing Up, which if you haven't seen it, I wish you would. It's a good film. I coached her on it. Um, <laughs> but it's a lovely film, and it's all about art making. She plays a sculptor, and it's really about the process of art. Went to Khan, did very well there. So it is possible to hold the line for what you care about. You will have to pay a price. Not everyone's going to want to play that game with you, but it's possible. Spencer. If you're creating a character for a film, maybe more particularly f f longer term for a series, w where do you start? Could you give like a general answer to what does the work look like in building a character? I talked about uh, to Bayard, what's the journey of Father Flynn? So as soon as I get back, Monday, I'm going to start working with Daniel Craig on Knives Out 3, which I haven't read yet. So I'll get back on Sunday, and that'll be my Sunday is reading that script. Now, it's not a total start from scratch thing because it's the character uh, you know and it's going to be the same character Benoit Blanc right so that's done and it's Ryan Johnson and I get the formula you get a bunch of co-stars all new cast people he's in some other thing and there's going to be a whodunit and like I get it all but we're still going to have to tell the story so the first thing I'm going to figure out is what new figure out, that's arrogant, try to figure out, um, is what, what are the new opportunities here for Daniel? Like, what aspect of Daniel, Daniel's character, are we looking at here that we haven't seen before, so it's not just the formula? And then what's the journey in this one for him, start to finish? And part of the formula of Knives Out is that he, the audience thinks it's someone else. 
and he sometimes thinks it's someone else. And then they go back and they recreate it through stop motion or whatever. They go, see, he was here the whole time. So how does he get lost? What are his Achilles heels? Who does he care about? Like, what are the relationships? What are the circumstances? What are the beats? What are, what are the events in the scenes? That's my broad stroke idea. And then once I start to get into the scenes, I'm going to start to imagine, well, what's his objective in that scene? And then what is he doing in every moment? So it's about the fourth thing I'm going to think about. But I'm pretty sure that as I read the script, I'm going to have some ideas about actions. And even before I've read the whole script, I'll have written some of those in, in pencil. Cool. And with what if you're trying to build a character and it's, you're getting the episodes as you go, and you're trying to build something, but they throw these curveballs, and you're just like, he would never. But then he does do that. I know. Like, what? Yeah. <laughs> Welcome to episodic TV as they're writing. <laughs> so it's that's weird. I was yeah. gonna ask kind of a similar thing. Is like character arc seems to be largely based on the writing, like it, it, and partly. Correct. What happened with Emmy and Shameless is that she started to do shit. They were doing market research. Audiences were sh responding to certain kinds of storylines. For a while, they wanted her to get naked a lot and have a lot of sex. Mm -hmm. Then at a certain point, she said, I don't want to do that. I'm not interested in that anymore. So you can see that for a while, seasons three, four, five, maybe, she was having more sex than she was having, according to the writers. Still, she had some control over that. She wasn't. But so partly the writing is in response to what the actor's doing and they start to write for you sometimes if you're on a season by season thing or what they're doing in their market research oh the fans really like it when Kayla does this or whatever and it's interesting I think it's I think it's hard you know sometimes so this actor who I'm working with is in Vancouver now shooting this Apple TV show where she's number one on the call sheet, it's a three episode, it's a three season arc. I mean, we don't know if it'll be called up for season two and season three, Apple could cancel it, but it's a very famous writer and showrunner, so chances are it will. She already knows what's gonna happen in season three, luckily. Why? Because the writer's the showrunner and he's, he's built it like that. And so of course things can change, but now, and she's ultimately gonna become the monster. So she starts out as the good guy. So it's cool to play with, how can we make sure that the shadow's there but we don't show it in season one? Because if she gets too dark in season one, she's not gonna have any place to go for seasons two and three as she's starting to transform, right? So that's helpful, but that doesn't always happen. Mm -hmm. Sometimes you don't know what's gonna happen, in which case, welcome to the weird business we're in. Yeah. yeah, and you just have to be flexible and nimble and go with it. And then those are interesting contradictions. Wow, what happened? I think that's kind of fun rather than a problem, Kayla. Actually, you know, even though it's not easy. What? Uh, just curious with regards to your coaching. Um, do you approach it differently when you're working film and TV versus plays? Not or do you're doing the same work not as what we did here? Okay, and my other question is when you're doing long-term coaching, like you said, you work with the same actor for three months for one project, do they Only see Only because they're willing to put in the investment. Sure, yeah, but is, is that something like you see them once a week, you see them twice a week? Depends. Probably once a week in a relationship like that, maximum three times a week. Okay. For Shameless, it was an hour and a half once a week per episode, for the whole episode. Um, that's what time she had, so that's what we did. So I, she'd send me the script on a Sunday. I'd read it. I'd mark it up. We'd meet the following Saturday because she'd be shooting the previous episode that week. And we'd have an hour to an hour and a half for all her scenes. We were pretty fast. Some other actors would want to spend more time. Depends. Yeah. But I don't do it. To me... Uh, the difference between film and television and stage is a matter of scale and size and something about technique where the camera comes to you rather than you putting it out. But an action is an action. Right. It's just a matter of having that person to rehearse with or not, right? Because TV, you're less likely to have that. Well, I usually end up being the person they rehearse with. I didn't used to do that. Sam always used to bring, I used to have people bring people 
And sometimes Sam still does that, but most of the time I'm the acting partner reading all the other characters. And I'm taking notes as I go along, and then I'm giving them feedback. It's, it's a little bit weird, yeah. Okay, and then I gotta go to this okay. uh, restaurant, yeah. The Vancouver restaurant. Yeah. Bev. So, Terry, you Tell said... Tell me your name, please. Beverly. Beverly. My friend's Why called... did you come here all these days, Beverly? What were you hoping to get out of this, and how come you weren't acting in any of these scenes? Because the class was full. Okay. Then, yeah, I was full. You said that it took a guy two years with um, the voice, because I have a voice coach, and I'm thinking six months, the most for us, so I'm trying to learn an American accent. Why? Well, no, oh. it, he was also working on vibration. He was oh, okay. also working on phonetics. Okay. So that's not normal to take two years with well, voice, Well, what right? are you trying to accomplish? I hear um, a dialect in you. Are you from yeah, somewhere? I'm trying, yeah, I'm trying to... Where are you um, from? Well, I was born in Barbados, but uh -huh. I lived in Bermuda for a long time. Uh -huh. And um, I moved to Canada. I got married to a Canadian. I studied here. Right. Yeah, so, so what are your goals with... with what you're calling your voice coach. What are you trying to achieve? Um, I want an American accent. So, I'll just say a tiny bit about that. The old, back, you know Backstage.com, which was a, a newspaper, The Trades, uh, you could just buy it on the street every Thursday, and it was filled with ads. and. You'd see many ads that would say um, accent reduction, mm -hmm. which was a real scam for a lot of people. And the idea was if you were from somewhere, you had to get rid of your accent so you sounded like you were from nowhere, which we call standard American, right? And standard American, in a way, it's sort of like RP for the British accent, which yeah. is like no one talks like that for the most part except newscasters. Um, so when I went to acting school, that was the work we did. We did work on the voice, which I was more interested in the voice than in dialects. I was interested in vocal production and vibration, because I think the film and television stuff kind of makes you rely just on the mic, and uh, you don't get to really work that stuff. And again, I'm going to bring up Brian Cox or Denzel Washington or Francis McDormand, who work in the theater do film and TV, return to the theater. And I don't think they're overacting, but they have a lot of vibration in their voice. So I'm talking about that when I speak about voice. I'm not talking about, oh, you sound like you're from Barbados. It's going to be hard for me to place you as someone from Tennessee. That, to me, is a separate issue. So the old way of doing it was, you got to get rid of that accent. you got to sound like you're from nowhere. That has now been recognized as a racist idea. Right? Because it means that you should be ashamed. It's like how people in India do skin lightening, right? Because they're ashamed of their dark skin. So the new idea around dialect that I think is more helpful is learn phonetics so that you can sound like whoever you sound like. You're from Barbados, you're from Kentucky, you're from whatever, not, be that. Not Canada. Maybe not Canada. Not allowed to say Utnaboot here. Yeah, what, no, 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 <laughs> no. Well, at home with your mother. Yeah. Right? But then when you get the job, be really good. Oh. It's a skill. It calls for an ear. You have to have a musical ear, right? And it's really about sound substitution. So when I was uh, showing off a little bit for Helena before, um, and partly it's because I have a wife from Cork, but if you want to work on a Dublin accent, there used to be this series called Acting with an Accent, which were these CDs or tapes that were put out by this doctor of speech. And he'd say, OK, here are the five or six sound substitutions that make up an Oklahoma accent, or in this case, let's say a Dublin accent. And one of them has to do with the I sound. I is a diphthong. I is actually two vowels next to each other. It's A and E. So if I say, hi, wow, that's a bright light. Now if I want to do a Dublin accent, I have to turn that I into oi. So that's why I said broit, loit, right? That's purely technical. It has nothing to do with talent, and it has nothing to do with where you were born. 
And what's cool about a dialect is you work with a dialect coach, yeah. Yeah. She's about right, who's good, and you just score the fucking thing out. And if you know phonetics, then you're in business. Yeah. So I'd learn phonetics, yeah. right? So that then they can just put that sound out, they can make the sounds for you, and then you just do that. And then sound like you're from Barbados. You don't have to lose your accent. Yeah. And then the second- But I am interested in having you guys have voices. Right. Which has nothing to do with any of that. And then the second point is a statement. Um, I was struggling with the emotional connection part because I, I just took a acting course. It was an intense weekend for, for two days. And for every scene, I, everybody in the class, we had to cry or find your emotional connection. But I think for me, the way you described it, and I, I was having this conversation with my husband um, the same night, um, the way you describe it where it should be more, um, you can make it up. Like, or, you know, it doesn't have to be real. It doesn't oh, it's have to real, be real, but it's not actual. It's right. It's real. It's like, real for you. It's the real for me. Are real, and the meaning is real, but it's not necessarily from your biology. Right. That and would be my route to it. Um, and then you know, when I finished, I could separate myself from it because it actually didn't happen to yeah, me, yeah. right? And when it's over, it's over. But I think what I love about Meisner, again, and, and then I got to go because I got this dinner reservation. I could, I could stay here with you guys and I'm enjoying it. Um, so my first day at NYU, we started with Streetcar Named Desire, as I said the other day. That now, and that, that is the way for most actor training, is you start with scene study. And then I also had a technique class where like, I don't know, we were doing method stuff, so coffee cup and all over sensation and taking a shower and stuff like that, even though there's no water and like imagining sensory details. I didn't really get the connection between that and Streetcar Named Desire, to be honest, and no one told me that. They just said, well, you got to do this, and you got to do that, and never the twain shall meet. <laughs> and then the scene would say, yeah, you got to cry, or yeah, you got to laugh. And so then people would do inorganic things or fake it or whatever. And so I wasn't really shown a way to create that reliably, and I think no one wants to take acting classes. They want to be able to act well all the time. And that, to me, is the purpose of training. Dentists don't want to go to dental school. They want to be good dentists. So they go to dental school so they can learn how to be dentists. What was mind-blowing for me and revolutionary for me is that the Meisner work is foundational. So it, to me, starting with Streetcar Named Desire would be the equivalent of starting piano lessons with Beethoven. You don't do that. No piano teacher is going to start you with Beethoven, even though you want to learn how to play Beethoven. You're going to start with Middle C. Someone who wants to be a ballerina is not going to start with Swan Lake. You're going to start with Plie, first position, second position. And even today at the New York City Ballet, they take company classes and they do plie, first position, second position. And if you keep training, then you do arabesque and some of these other things, right, so that you can start to do repertoire. But you don't start with repertoire because you need a vocabulary. So the Meisner work starts with something really simple. It's not Beethoven. It's not Chekhov. It's um, you have matches on your shirt. Repeat it back to me. I have matches on my shirt. You have matches on your shirt. I have matches on my shirt. Yeah, you have matches on your shirt. I have matches on my shirt. I said, yeah, I added the word, yeah. Uh, yeah, I have matches on my shirt. What's with the attitude? What's with the attitude? What is with the attitude? What's with the attitude? Fuck you, too. Fuck you, too. Fuck me, too. Fuck you, too. Fuck me, too. Fuck you, too. Fuck me, too. Fuck you, too. Fuck you, too. <laughs> Fuck, fuck me too. Fuck you too. <laughs> fuck us both. Fuck us both. Fuck us both. <laughs> right? Now, that's improvisation. That is not Chekhov. But it's the seed of Chekhov. Mm -hmm. And Meisner was very interested in seeds because seeds have within them the DNA of the whole thing. So Meisner would say, mighty oak trees from tiny acorns grow. An acorn 
which is this big, has within it the entire DNA of the oak tree. And with care, and with water, and with sunlight, and with soil, and with the right conditions, and with time, that acorn becomes that, just as all of us started as seeds, microscopic seeds. A sperm and an egg got together in our mama's belly, or somewhere, and uh, in the case of IVF, and that became a one-celled animal that then became two, that then became four, microscopic, and then look at this shit, right? And all the DNA was there from the beginning. You can't add that. So Meisner was interested in foundations. And we go very systematically, step by step by step, kind of like learning to juggle. If you want to juggle five balls for Cirque du Soleil, you don't start with five, you start with one. And there's actually skill in juggling one ball. Just being able to throw it up and catch it and have it have the same place at the same time, that takes practice. And when I work with my guitar teacher, sometimes I have these songs I want to work on. He says, you're not ready for that. I've been playing for a long time. It's a little bit hard on my ego, but I trust him. <laughs> and he says, let's do this instead. And he's right. And the other day, I had a lesson from here on Wednesday. And we're working on uh, the Ray Charles song, George On My Mind, hmm. which I love, playing finger style, sort of a jazzy finger style. And he said, let's just do the first two bars and loop it. Just the first two chords, right? Goes from a G to an F sharp diminished to a, a, a B seventh, a B, dom B dom dom dominant B seven chord. Right? And we just did that over and over and over and over. And sometimes we just did the melody, and sometimes we just did the bass. And then we started to do both of them. And we spent a half an hour on two measures. And those two measures started to get good. So a weekend acting class where they're saying, everybody cry and be raped to me is criminal, actually. And I don't think that has anything to do with your talent. I think you need foundational work. And that was what was revolutionary for me about the Meisner work, is that step by step by step, and it doesn't take forever, it's a two-year process, I had a set of tools and a way of working that has lasted the rest of my life. Everything I do with Sam Rockwell comes from the two years we spent together. No new vocabulary, right? It's all the same tools. So how to cry is very doable. How to laugh is very doable. It's doing truthfully under imaginary circumstances to figure out what could happen if it happened, that if it happened, might do that. And the focus is not on the tears, right? So when I was trying to share the other day about this person who was very generous to me, that starts to open stuff up for me, right? in an interesting way. And if I sit with it and warm it up, I'm gonna have what I need. So don't worry about tears. Worry about being in contact and see a lot of good work and get into a good class where they're not demanding that you cry or have yourself be raped. So stressful. Yeah, you don't need that stress. Okay, I gotta go. Jeb. Okay. Yeah.